So um, this is, of course, the kickoff ceremony for the University of Delaware's William S. Carlson International Polar Year events. I'm Fritz Nelson from the university's Department of Geography, and I'm a co-chair of the Carlson IPY Events Committee. As I was saying, it's absolutely wonderful to see the interest that the International Polar Year has created here in Delaware, a very long ways from either of the polar regions. And the remarkable, actually I think under the circumstances, it's very fair to say this, it's a remarkable turnout given the weather circumstances. And we of course had a, uh, a very large reservation list here, even larger than what we see in the auditorium here. Those two things I think together this evening are really clear evidence that happenings at so-called ends of the earth continue to fascinate residents of the lower latitudes, much as they did a century and more ago. But in contrast to the situation in 1882 during the first international polar year, when, the first, when it was first celebrated, it's abundantly clear to us today that what happens in the polar regions ultimately has very strong potential to affect the rest of the world. And I don't think this case could be made any more strikingly than it was on the front page of our local newspaper just a few weeks ago, about two months ago. The headline on the right, Polar Ice melt Melting Alarms Experts, reflects concerns about the effects of warming in the far off polar regions, while the article in the center of the page tells us about the efforts of Delawareans to reduce our collective carbon footprint. And the interconnectedness, this interconnectedness of geographic scale is really striking. As you can see from the logos appearing on the screen, our partner organization is the American Geographical Society of New York City. AGS has a very long history of involvement in the international polar years, and the society's involvement in polar exploration and research go back to its founding in 1851. The central focus of our ceremony this evening is a most remarkable object, the AGS Flyers and Explorers Globe, and the intrepid explorer who's about to become the 78th ind individual to affix his or her signature to it, Captain Lawson W. Brigham of the U.S. Coast Guard, who holds a doctorate in polar oceanography from Cambridge University and is currently deputy director of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. Well, before I go further, I'd like to convey our greetings and welcome to the people who are watching this ceremony via live via the webcast, and I think there are probably many more of them than was attended a couple of hours ago, that was arranged by our university's excellent communication services. In particular, we extend our best regards to those who will view this ceremony tomorrow from Paris at the launch of the International Year of Planet Earth. We're deeply grateful to you for your interest in our activities and wish you every success in yours over the coming months. At this point, I'm going to read a letter that was received a few days ago from the director of the International Polar Year's International Program Office in Cambridge, England. It reads as follows. I take great pleasure to offer my congratulations to you and to your colleagues at the University of Delaware on the successful launch of the W.S. Carlson International Polar Year events. The International Polar Year 2007-2008 has attracted enormous interest from participants around the world. Its breadth of research covers the full array of geophysical, ecological, and social sciences. It includes researchers from polar and non-polar polar nations, and in the north, develops new partnerships with indigenous communities. It also reminds us of previous international polar years and of our rich history of international cooperation in the study and protection of the polar regions. In addition to urgent research, this IPY includes extensive outreach conducted in classrooms and museums and on campuses around the world. The series of lectures, films, and exhibits planned at the University of Delaware to honor the career of William Samuel Carlson and to celebrate your strong legacy of polar research connect you and your guests with similar events in Sikdivar, Hobart, Barcelona, Fairbanks, and many other places at which events are happening during IPY. Through these events, we renew our individual and collective curiosity and concern for polar regions. Finally, I extend through you my congratulations to our friend and partner, Captain Lawson Brigham. 
Lawson's wisdom and experience and devotion to international cooperation make important and continuing contributions to polar research and polar affairs. We all feel delighted to have the signature of one of our polar heroes added to the Flyers and Explorers Globe. I extend again my greetings and congratulations and convey our deep appreciation for this celebration as part of the International Polar Year. Cordially, and check the name out, David Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> now, before recognizing our sponsors and turning the lectern over to the other speakers, I really feel a very strong urge to tell you an anecdote about how the Carlson IPY events came into being. My area of research is permafrost, perennially frozen ground, so it's natural for me to spend a lot of time in Alaska. In June of 2006, I was in the University of Alaska's field station at Tulik Lake in the northern foothills of the Brooks Range. I'd gotten up fairly early for breakfast and was sitting alone in the mess hall when a young guy came in and asked if he could sit down with me. I said, sure. And being a geographer, I asked him where he was from. He said, the East Coast. Hmm. I said, where on the East Coast? He said, the University of Delaware. The young gentleman was Tom Hansen, a professor in UD's College of Marine and Earth Studies. We agreed that it was an extraordinary situation, that we were at the same, oh, fairly good-sized university, and didn't know about each other's work. Well, when I got back home, I began to search the university's website and found there were no fewer than 25 faculty and research staff at UD who were interested in the polar regions. And in fact, I've learned since that there are a significantly larger number than that. Through some archival work I'd been doing, I was aware that the university had had a president in the late 1940s who had been very active in the Arctic. And with the fourth international polar year only a few months away, it seemed that it uh, could provide an excellent vehicle for bringing the university's polar types together. Moreover, we had an excellent trademark, if you will, in Carlson's name. A proposal was submitted to the office of the provost, and in due course, the project was approved. The Carlson IPY events is the 2008 realization of an ongoing annual series called UD and the Global Community that's sponsored by the Center for International Studies and the Provost's Office. As many of you know, our study abroad programs are highly rated, and UD is among the very top institutions in this regard. In fact, a group of our students has just returned from study abroad program in Antarctica, and a collection of their photographs that they took there is on display in the reception area, along with many, many other interesting artifacts and maps and things that I'll say a few things about later. And we invite you to look at these and the many other exhibits that we have on display in the lobby of this building. The Carlson IPY series was conceived as a way to achieve four interrelated goals. First, we want to cultivate recognition, appreciation, and enthusiasm at the university and in the state about the high latitude regions and their importance for the rest of the world. Second, we want to create a sense of polar community at UD. In other words, to develop an esprit de corps among our faculty and students interested in the Arctic and Antarctic. Third, we'd like to create a distinct and visible role for the University of Delaware in the International Polar Year. And fourth, we want to, as I frequently put it, put UD on the polar map. In other words, to create recognition for the scope and the diversity and the importance of polar research that's done at this institution. We've developed a plan to do this through a series of public lectures, the first of which will be delivered on Thursday night by Dr. Brigham. We're also supporting a year-long series of departmental and interdisciplinary seminars, a film series, and exhibits of art and polar artifacts. Education is an extremely important part of the larger International Polar Year and of our activities here at the university and in the state of Delaware. And this point will be made forcefully by tonight's speakers. It's also, and it is also apparent in the displays in the reception area. And we plan to produce a printed record commemorating the Carlson IPY events. So very briefly, the rhetorical question, who was this William Samuel Carlson? He began his lifelong involvement with the high latitudes as an undergraduate student by participating in one of the University of Michigan's Greenland expeditions. As a graduate student, he led another one of those expeditions. During World War II, as a colonel in the US Army Air Forces, he used his knowledge of Greenland and the Arctic to develop several air transportation routes that helped to resolve the conflict in the European theater. 
He was also a founding member of the Arctic Institute of North America. A year after the war ended, Carlson assumed the presidency of this institution at the age of 40. His presidency had a great effect on the University of Delaware, and he had a similarly large effect on other institutions that he led, including the State University of New York and the University of Toledo. And through it all, he continued his interest in the polar regions. He published papers and books about the Arctic right up until the time of his retirement in the early 1970s. So we believe that it's most appropriate to name our IPY series after a man who had such a profound effect on our institution and indeed on the world. You can learn more about Carlson's accomplishments and exploits on the, uh, on the CRT, on the television that's running in the reception area. And later in the year, we'll have a separate event dedicated to Carlson himself. I take this opportunity, uh, I would be remiss not to introduce the committee that has labored long and hard to make the Carlson IPY events a reality. Lisa Griffiths, director of UD's Center for International Studies, co-chairs the committee. The body of the committee is made up of Kathy Geiger of the Department of Geography, Bernie Herman, chair of Art History, George Irvin of the Center for International Studies, Dave Kirchman of the College of Marine and Earth Studies, Tom Sims, Associate Dean of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and Dana Verone from Marine and Earth Studies. And now, a word from our sponsors. This series was developed with financial support from the university's Office of the Provost, including the Vice Provost for Research and Graduate Studies, and each of its seven colleges. The Office of Public Relations has provided an extraordinary amount of expertise and dedication in the execution of this, as well as financial support. The University of Delaware Library has been most helpful. Beginning later this week, the AGS Globe and many of the items in the lobby will be on display in the second floor of the Morris Library. And of course, our profound thanks go to the American Geographical Society for its partnership in our year-long series. The Society's illustrious history of polar involvements adds tremendously to the University's impressive record of research and education about the Arctic and Antarctic. It's now my honor and privilege to turn the lectern over to the Provost of the University, Dr. Dan Rich. Well, thank you, Fritz, and welcome. Uh, good evening, and welcome to uh, uh, all of you on behalf of the entire University of Delaware community, all of you who are here on this, uh, this very wintry uh, evening, thank you for being hearty souls and being with us, uh, uh, gathered together in greater spirit for the, for the numbers. And those who are participating through a, a webcast, we're, we're delighted to have this assembly uh, tonight for a very special uh, purpose, as you've heard, to launch the Carlson International Polo Year. And the occasion is certainly made uh, even more special because uh, it represents uh, the fruition and the continuation of a partnership between the university and the American Geographical uh, Society. And uh, it is uh, true that uh, both institutions have a uh, very long and uh, significant record of polar research. And tonight, in a sense, is a celebration of those achievements. It's a, it's a great honor for the university to have our friends and colleagues from uh, AGS to be with us to, to participate in this celebration. And, and, I, and I don't want to go any further before I, I recognize someone else who's done all the other recognitions, and that's uh, Professor Fritz Nelson, uh, without whom we would not be here tonight, I can assure you, because he's been uh, the true spirit of this entire enterprise from the, from the very beginning. And so I thank you, Ritz, on behalf of all of us who will be the beneficiaries of your good work. And should there be anyone in the audience uh, here on web who did not know, this has been a very special year for Professor Nelson because uh, not too long ago he was uh, recognized by the uh, uh, International Panel for Climate Change, which uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, for being uh, one of the Nobel laureates that participated in that Peace Prize. So it's, uh, it's quite a year. <clears throat> um, William Bill Carlson. Now you heard about him as a polar researcher. And, uh, and I have a confession to make of, of sorts, and that is I, I work in a building called Hullion Hall, administration building. 
and my office is, uh, is about, oh, I'd say about 20 feet from his portrait, you know, and I'll never look at it the same way again, <laughs> yeah, I assure you. Um, but he had a distinction here at the University of Delaware. I thought I'd say just a few words about that. He had a very brief tenure, uh, 1946 to uh, 1950, as you heard from Fritz, came here uh, 40 years old, uh, right after uh, World War II. Uh, was uh, recognized by our great historian of the University of Delaware, John Monroe, as uh, having been a very successful and popular uh, president. But the message here is, despite the brevity of his uh, tenure, uh, this was a particularly important time uh, for this uh, university's development, and perhaps it took someone with the determination of being a polar explorer and researcher to make those changes happen. It was a period of growth and a period in which the true character of the University of Delaware was very greatly enriched in important ways. During his uh, brief tenure, uh, 46 to 50, enrollment tripled. During his brief tenure, the first doctoral degree was conferred by the University of Delaware. And during his brief tenure, the first African-American students were admitted to the University of Delaware. So it was quite, quite a time, quite a transformation that was led by this uh, rather extraordinary uh, individual. Uh, when he came to the university, he was uh, trying to strengthen the graduate and research identity of the institution to begin with, and he did what uh, many good leaders do. He tried to lead by uh, example. He uh, implemented a series of uh, re university-wide research seminars Another good reason for us to be assembled in, as the Carlson uh, International Poll Year. And, and, and he actually offered one of these seminars, and his, his title was Problems of Polar Research, quite aptly. By the way, I, just as a digression, uh, President Patrick Harker uh, was unable to uh, uh, join us this evening. He's unable uh, because uh, he's teaching the first class of his first course at the University of Delaware, so, so we take our teaching very seriously, and being president is no excuse. Uh, you're there, and you, and you, uh, and you show up. Um, tremendous transformations uh, in the period since uh, Bill Carlson was uh, president, and it's, uh, it's appropriate uh, that we assemble now in, uh, 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 in his name uh, through the International Polar Year to reaffirm this university's commitment to polar research. As you've uh, heard from uh, uh, Fritz, uh, both in terms of empirical data, but I think the story of uh, meeting his colleague, polar regions, and not having met before is rather extraordinary. It tells you something about uh, the depth and, uh, and expanse of polar research at the University of Delaware today, much more significant and extensive than uh, I believe even uh, Bill Carlson could conceive at the time uh, he gave his first seminar. So today we, uh, we assemble at a different University of Delaware, uh, one which is a major graduate and research university, one that has 3,500 graduate students, uh, one that has 43 different doctoral programs and confers over a couple of hundred doctorates uh, each year. Uh, and I expect that uh, Bill Carlson would be very pleased and very impressed by the legacy he helped to inspire. It's uh, fitting that this reaffirmation of our commitment to all of this work uh, occurs during the fourth International Polar Year, and it's a privilege to celebrate uh, this occasion with our colleagues from the American Geographical uh, Society. Uh, in light of changes that are uh, occurring through global climate change, the polar regions are becoming better recognized as extremely important to the world's environments and the world's economies. Uh, global warming uh, could be amplified by the release of carbon from thawing permafrost, and you can hear a lot more about this and other facets from Dr. Brigham, who will address us with the first Carlson lecture on Thursday and, and explain that the decrease in the extent of uh, sea ice has uh, on the Arctic Ocean has significant implications for those of us who live here uh, in, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic, 
uh, in Delaware for trade and tourism and uh, resource use. And uh, of course, Delaware uh, is, as a coastal state, we're, we're particularly concerned with rising sea levels that could be produced from melting glaciers and ice sheets. And some uh, projections indicate that we are now assembled here in Newark, uh, 20 miles from the Atlantic Ocean, in what will, uh, in the not too distant future, become oceanfront property. Uh, in fact, uh, you may not know, but uh, we have a great distinction as a state, small state. We are, I think, uh, one of only two states uh, classified by the federal government in which the entire state is called a co coastal community. And so uh, it does really matter to us. And in part for that reason, our governor, Ruth Ann Minner, had hoped to be with us this evening, but uh, her uh, schedule would not uh, permit that to uh, take place. Uh, but she does uh, extend her best wishes. And she also has uh, asked uh, that uh, she be recognized here through uh, a colleague. And recognizing that the true subject of, uh, of uh, this occasion is uh, the importance of science and exploration uh, and education to the future of this state, to our nation, and to the global community, uh, she's represented tonight by uh, Kelly Martin from the Delaware Department of Education. And, and she just happens to be a University of Delaware alumna, so that makes it even better. Uh, she's also a science teacher, uh, the head of the Delaware Science Coalition, and, and she's worked with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, involved in uh, polar projects and in activities related to the International Polar Year. So it's a pleasure uh, to uh, recognize Kelly Morton. Kelly? Uh, thank you very much. On behalf of our governor, the Honorable Ruth Ann Minner, and our Secretary of Education, Valerie Woodruff, I convey congratulations to Captain Brigham on this momentous occasion today, the signing of the American Geographical Society's Flyers and Explorers Globe. I also wish to convey the excitement of the K-12 education community as the University of Delaware launches the Carlson International Polar Year events. This is quite exciting. Uh, it has been through the pioneering efforts of people such as Captain Brigham that we've increased our scientific knowledge on the polar areas. This knowledge forms the grounds up focus of International Polar Year and is the knowledge that I hope to inspire 120,000 K-12 public school students so that they could become the next group of polar researchers and pioneers. I'm responsible for science education in Delaware public schools, and science in Delaware is unlike science in any other state or any other content area in the state in that science is done on a statewide level in Delaware. So because it's a statewide science system, everyone using the same curricular materials in the public schools, it's very easy for us to then transfer that material through the use of the International Polar Year activities. So today, I would like to share with you some K-12 science resources that are available to educators just to bring your attention to them. Let's see. Here we go. First of all, to inspire and motivate our students, there are a myriad number of posters available. We all like posters. <laughs> and websites that are available. The IPI website itself contains many lessons, activities, photos, you name it. NOAA also has a lot of things that are available. My colleagues and I get together several times during the year. There's someone who has my same position in all of the other states. And we recently were together this past fall in Washington to learn about International Polar Year and NOAA at that time had presented all of the teachers with a wonderful CD just packed full of animations, photographs, lesson plans, statistical data, everything that you could ever want. USGS is the third site that I'd like to point out today, which also has just the most marvelous data, photographs, everything. When you go to the IPY website, one of the things that you notice is every three months is an International Polar Day, where if you download, if you get onto these sites, take a look at it, you can notice that last December, ice sheets was the topic. Next month, it's going to be changing Earth. 
what a relevant topic given the way that we started this presentation today. This is what the website looks like from IPY when you get onto International Polar Days. Notice all of the available resources that are on there for teachers to use to transfer concepts that are learned in the classroom to the polar regions. Notice also that if I'm an educator, I could pull up activities that don't require a lot of prep time that are short term to those that require a lot of long lead time. I didn't intend for you to look at this slide and see everything on it, but I did intend for you to understand the magnitude of what's available educationally. Each of these honeycombs on here represents a project or an exploration in earth, land, people, oceans, ice, atmosphere, and space. On the other side, you see all the education and outreach things that are available, as well as all the information on exploration and projects that are going on at the polls. Remember, this is a collaborative effort among 60 different nations. So there's a lot, a wealth of information available for K-12s. This is the NOAA site. Notice on here that there are lesson plans for middle school and high school teachers. They're all directly tied to the National Science Education Standards. This is the USGS site. Notice it also has satellite imagery, all kinds of really interesting things. So if you can't go to the polls, the next best thing might be to go online and get resources and take a look at them. When pulling up the USGS site, notice all the information that's available. This is one on permafrost and lots of data on permafrost, as well as just all of the photos that are there. So while our students, for example, are studying ecosystems in first grade, fourth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade. They can also not only look at food webs and chains and the cycling of nutrients, but they can pull up statistical data and look at populations of walruses, for example. There's a lot of things, a lot of data that's available. This is a look at our unified science system in the state. So you can see where everything is taught and see how everything can flow into this. We can, for example, at first grade at solids and liquids, when students learn what makes a liquid a liquid or what makes a solid a solid, you might want to ask them the question next after going through the activities on modeling sea ice, is ice a solid or a liquid? <laughs> so in conclusion, I just wanted to say that International Pool Year is really a motivating time for our students K to 12. We really wish to express our congratulations, but more importantly, our thanks, because it's with this knowledge that's gained from the polar regions that we're able to use this in the classroom, that we're able to actually inspire and motivate students, and once again, hopefully become the next scientists. So thank you. At this point, it's a very distinct honor and, again, a privilege to introduce the president of the American Geographical Society, Dr. Jerome Dotson, and Mary Lynn, I'm sorry, very sorry, uh, Mary Lynn Bird, the executive director of the AGS. It would not be appropriate for us to visit the University of Delaware without making mention of a very particular connection between the university and the American Geographical Society. And I can say it in one name, John Russell Mather. Uh, he was, as you know, the chair of the geography department here for, I gather, 20 years. Is that right, Fritz? He was also a member of the Council of the American Geographical Society for much longer than that. I believe he was elected in 1979, and he served as secretary and uh, actually then became Counselor Emeritus until he died. Uh, a very important person in our history, a very important person in your history. Um, Russ was he was an environmental geographer. He was not a specialist on the polar regions, but as we can obviously hear and understand, the state of, of weather uh, was very much connected with what's going on in the polar regions. So I think he would have been delighted uh, at this event and at this connection. And I think he also would have been very pleased at seeing the American Geographical Society and the University of Delaware cooperating on something as close to his heart as this topic. Thank you. 
The American Geographical Society is the second oldest geographical association in North America. The only one older is the Mexican Geographical Society. The National Geographic Society was formed uh, quite a few years later, Association of American Geographers later, uh, and so we claim to be the second oldest geographical association in North America, and um, we were formed uh, largely to support, the original purpose was largely to support Arctic exploration. I'll go into that just a little bit later. Many of you may know us by our publications, the Geographical Review, which is a premier journal in geography, and Focus on Geography, which is a more popular style magazine. Educational travel programs, perhaps some of you have traveled with us. Uh, both Fritz and I have led, um, and several of the others in the audience here have uh, led these uh, uh, cruises, lecture cruises um, in our educational travel program. We sponsored Arctic, Antarctic, and Andean exploration for a century. If you look at our, the, the division between that, you can see a long period of Arctic exploration for almost a full century, and then you see Antarctic extending on out. We actually funded the last privately funded uh, expedition to Antarctica. But others, Panama Canal, Transcontinental Railway, uh, all involving exploration as well as policymaking. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this one, the, uh, not list each item, but what happened here was that uh, Henry Grinnell was the largest private donor supporter of Arctic exploration in the middle of the 1800s. He had funded the first Grinnell expedition to search for the Lost Franklin expedition. And if you can imagine a time, uh, imagine today if an astronaut were lost in space and the whole world was concerned and we thought we could reach out, perhaps get them back. That's, that's the climate in 1850. And uh, Grinnell had funded one of these expeditions and he was ready to fund another, but he needed help. So he formed the society primarily to uh, get help from other colleagues in the New York area, uh, including the publisher of the New York Times. Uh, there are uh, some other interesting uh, uh, causes along the way there. If you notice, the last four of those, uh, Robert Perry was actually president of the society. I'm pleased to name him as one of my predecessors as uh, president. In um, those last four expeditions there, you see that half of them are exploration and half are relief. It turns out we spent exactly the same amount of money and made exactly the same amount of uh, uh, expeditions in his relief as we did in his exploration. Um, we uh, supported Arctic exploration, Antarctic exploration, right up to 1948, and that was the Finn Ronnie expedition, which was the uh, last privately funded expedition. I want to mention one other thing in there. You notice, um, I guess it's on this one, you see the School of Surveying. We uh, had what was called a School of Surveying, but that was a misnomer. It was actually a school during the 1920s to teach explorers what to look for, how to know where they were when they got there, uh, and how to turn exploration into science. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when we were formed in 1851, the, blanks of the, the maps of the West were fairly blank, and we uh, helped develop the base of understanding uh, to make the decision as to where to place the Transcontinental Railway. Uh, we got very heavily involved in moderating the debate over the Panama Canal. Uh, one that may surprise you is the transatlantic telegraph cable. We were very much involved in that because one of our counselors was Matthew Fontaine Maury, who was the uh, head of the National Observatory, was actually uh, uh, the leading oceanographer of the day. He had the information about the ocean floor that would tell where the um, cable could best be laid. One of our other counselors at the time was Samuel F. B. Morse, who was the inventor of the telegraph, and then later uh, Cyrus W. Field, who was actually the promoter of the transatlantic cable, joined with them. 
Uh, in World War I, we were commissioned by President Woodrow Wilson to run what was called the Inquiry, and it was a uh, massive analysis of foreign intelligence, uh, not spying, but analyzing the information that was coming in from all over the world. President Wilson was very concerned about the United States' ability to deal with foreign governments and foreign intelligence because we had not, we'd been an, an isolationist country for so long and we'd not been engaged in any foreign wars. So he actually commissioned the American Geographical Society to do that. And through that effort, because of that, we were actually responsible for drafting Wilson's 14 points. The nine of those, the 14 that were territorial in nature. The man in charge of that was Isaiah Bowman, who was our executive director at the time. We advised and supported the American delegation throughout the Paris Peace Conference. And uh, because of that, all of the, the delegates to that peace conference signed our wall in New York. From 1925 to 1945, we um, produced what was called the millionth map of Hispanic America. And what it means is that we mapped all of Latin America using very strict standards at one to one million scale, using private funds, produced maps and nautical charts, and those were the finest available until long after World War II. Uh, a recent commentary on it by a scholar in Britain says, one of the most important and expensive topographic mapping projects ever undertaken by a private non-governmental agency. But what's even uh, more revealing is when you read Ernest K. Gans, Gans' book, Fate is the Hunter, and you see his uh, comments about the maps that he was using, which were AGS maps. He didn't know that, but he said, whoever conceived these charts was more than a devoted cartographer and could not have been content with mere facts. What are we doing today? One of our big initiatives is promulgating a new, world sta new worldwide standard for cartographic symbolization of landmines, minefields, and mine actions. That's uh, funded by the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining, uh, which is affiliated with the United Nations. You can see why this is important if you look at the symbols on maps in three neighboring countries in the Balkans. You see how confusing that would be. And imagine for a moment how um, great the penalty is for misreading a map symbol for a, a landmine. This is the symbol set that uh, was developed by one of my students at the University of Kansas and is being promulgated by the American Geographical Society very successfully, I might add. Uh, more recently, we have started an initiative uh, called Bowman Expeditions, named after Isaiah Bowman. Uh, the purpose of this is that it's because we're very concerned, as I'm sure many of you are, about the United States state of geographic knowledge about foreign areas and how that affects our policy making. Uh, so we lead these expeditions. Uh, their purpose is, when they go there is to collect geographic data it's open source and unclassified. Uh, they conduct research, and it, the, it's at the investigator's choice. It, it's their discretion. The investigator gets to decide. Now, the idea is to have one, each team consists of one faculty member, two or three graduate students, and one or more foreign institutions and their faculty and graduate students. And that's worked very successfully. Uh, the intent is to be there for a full semester every year. When we, we propose this as a grand plan, and that means sending a team to every country in the world, but the price tag to do that would be about $125 million a year, which is large by university standards, but not, not large by uh, government standards. The current reality is that we have one project in Mexico that's been there for three years, one expedition to the Antilles region, it's in its second year, Colombia just beginning, Jordan just beginning, and another uh, country coming soon. And the re reality to date is we put one million, two million, uh, one hundred thousand dollars into that. One of our legacies from this connection with polar research, Arctic research, exploration all over the world is our globe. And we're extremely proud of it. The um, names that you see on there, Louise Boyd, uh, one of the most outstanding female explorers of all time, but 
ranks high of all explorers of all time, but very little known. She actually uh, made sonar soundings of the channels on both sides of Greenland. Robert Perry, uh, Frijof Nansen, Amundsen at the South Pole, Robert, Richard Byrd in several places. We have this photograph of John Glenn signing it and being uh, observed by John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, and those children are, are Robert Kennedy's children. I'm going to turn the podium over to John Noble Wilford, who's going to tell you a little more about the globe itself. And before I do that, I'm going to show a video that will give you a glimpse of it and some of the events that have been commemorated on it. Let me just say that John Noble Wilford is the senior science correspondent of the New York Times. He's a member of our council, has been for many years an officer in the AGS. Uh, he's also the author, author of The Map Makers and a wonderful friend to geography. He's also, he and I are both University of Tennessee grads. So. Well, let's do the video and then John will come to the stage. To reach the pinnacle, to descend to the very depths of the ocean, to cross a vast frozen landscape, to look back at Earth from space. From the beginning, it has been human nature to dream of conquering the unknown, to achieve what has not yet been done. A handful have been successful. People like Robert Perry and Matthew Henson, Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, and Sir Edmund Hillary. But after the winds of time have swept away the footfalls, what is left of their extraordinary accomplishments? It is the role of the geographer to capture and interpret what has been discovered by venturing through the doors opened by the explorers. This is the mission of the American Geographical Society. And through their tradition of supporting exploration, some of the most important expeditions ever have been undertaken. Just as important has been AGS's role as a scientific leader and advocate for the protection of our planet. Today, members of the AGS are using geographical information technologies to locate landmines in war-torn nations, to analyze the effects of pollution on urban forests, and to model the impact of viral outbreaks on population centers. The need to explore our world is as important and demanding as ever. Courageous men and women at great personal risk continue to explore, so that geographers and concerned individuals, like those affiliated with the American Geographical Society, can give us the reward of knowledge to protect our planet and expand our horizons. Delighted to be here at the University of Delaware on this occasion of the, marking the International Polar Year. Uh, I, I don't want to bring up irrelevancies, but it, 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 it occurred to me that this is also the 199th birthday of Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln. And yes, they, they were born on the same day in the same year, but not, of course, in the same country. But it, and this led me further to think about if the American Geographical Society had had its globe back then, surely the rules would have allowed the signature of Charles Darwin and the route, the tracing of the voyage of the Beagle as perhaps our first signature on the, um, the globe. Well, I've been asked to fill in some of the background of the globe, um, and I guess the reason they want me is because 
of this tenuous link I have with the origin of the globe. Um, the globe was a gift to the society by John H. Finley, who was editor-in-chief of the New York Times back in the 1930s. And before that, in the 20s, he had been president of the um, American Geographical Society. Um, in, his, in his position as uh, Times editor, Finley had invited heroes of exploration and aviation to sign this globe of his. And later he presented it to the Geographical Society, which has kept up the tradition ever since. Uh, and as you've heard, uh, some of the great names of exploration are on this uh, globe. It should be pointed out that Finley's association and the Times' association with the globe was not unusual. Back in those days, uh, the early part of the 20th century, and even earlier, um, many of the newspapers, particularly in New York, competed for readers by uh, obtaining the exclusive rights to the stories of explorers in exchange for some money which the explorers used to explore with. Uh, the, um, I don't know what we're going to use these days to encourage more readers of newspapers, but uh, that's, that's for us to worry about. Of course, the, the most celebrated uh, newspaper association with exploration was the New York Herald's uh, dispatch of Henry Morton um, Stanley to find David Livingston in, in Africa. Uh, at the Times, our editors landed the exclusive stories of Robert Perry, which uh, we've talked about, first person to reach the North Pole, though there is lingering dispute as to exactly how close he actually got. But that's not for here. Um, another exclusive is, is Richard Byrd's, uh, who, who flew over both the, the who was the first to fly over uh, each of the, uh, the North and the South Poles. And we also had the first first person account of Lindbergh's solo flight across the Atlantic, which we filed immediately after his landing in Paris. Well, things are different now uh, in newspapering um, and in exploration. Um, I neither accompanied Neil Armstrong to the moon, alas, nor get his exclusive story. But the Geographical Society got Neil's signature just a few years ago on the globe, as well as John Glenn's, Frank Borman's, and several other astronauts. But if you look closely at the um, globe, you will also see one of the great names in 20th century exploration and heroics, uh, Edmund Hillary's signature right at, at Mount Everest, where else? Um, some of us remember with awe his first, his, his feet and, and uh, the feeling of uh, excitement at the time. Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, the, the Sherpa guide, surmounted the top of the world, Mount Everest, as high as anyone can aspire and still be rooted unto, on terra firma. That was in May of 53. At Hillary's death last month, at age 88, I was reminded of the symbolism of his magnificent achievement. It seemed to me to be a culmination of the exploring era of crossing oceans, penetrating continental interiors, reaching the ends of the earth. At the time, uh, Everest seemed not much less forbidding and unattainable than the moon. And going to the moon, of course, in those days was still science fiction. When I was a youngster, we still feasted on the daring of Lewis and Clark, Stanley and Livingston, Amundsen and Perry, Byrd and Lindbergh. Then four years after Everest, Sputnik was launched. Let me plagiarize myself uh, for, uh, the, in the appreciation I wrote after Hillary's death ran in the New York Times. 
It is tempting to think of the conquest of Everest as the moment we reached the crest of a divide in exploration. In the spirit of the lone pilot and the hearty bands of yore, this was an undertaking by two heroic individuals. But the successful Everest climb with its team of a dozen climbers and 350 porters anticipated mission control in Houston and the mobilization of aerospace contractors on this side of the divide. We see that some things haven't changed. Echoes of Hillary's matter-of-fact words can be heard from the astronauts who followed. Hillary encountering a widening split in the ice underfoot says, it was a nasty shock. I could look down 10,000 feet between my legs. Compare that with the astronaut after an explosion in the rear of the Apollo 13 spacecraft. Houston, we've had a problem. One difference does come to mind, and it is troubling when seen from both sides of the divide in exploration. Sir Edmund lamented the hordes scaling Everest these days, leaving their trash behind. Uh, space enthusiasts uh, have an opposite complaint. No one has landed or walked on the moon since 1972. No one has yet flown to Mars. I close my article with a reflection of the time in 1985 when the two who epitomized exploration before and after Sputnik flew together. Two signers of the globe, Ed Hillary and Neil Armstrong, flew in a twin engine plane over the Arctic and landed at the North Pole. Oh, to have listened in to the man on the moon with the man atop Everest, again looking out on stunning but forbidding landscape. This evening I realized that perhaps I drew too sharp a line along this divide in exploration, old and new. There are still feats of skill and wonder to be performed here on earth by individuals whose achievements are worthy of a place on the Flyers and Explorers globe. I refer, of course, to Lawson Brigham and his voyage of the Polar Sea. Thank you. It's a long-standing American Geographical Society tradition that a previous signer of the Flyers and Explorers Globe introduce the evening's, uh, the evening's ceremony. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Dr. Don Walsh, who in 1960 was the man who dove to the, uh, the lowest point on the Earth's surface. Don? Thank you very much. I uh, have thoroughly enjoyed my association with uh, AGS, and I was delighted to accept their invitation to uh, be with you this evening. I live in the town of Dora in southwest Oregon, uh, and when I left on this trip yesterday, the population dropped 10 percent. <laughs> so you can get an idea of uh, my resurrection uh, into the natural world. My wife and I have a, a ranch there, and there aren't any people around. And we had been sp spent 20 years in Los Angeles, so we can appreciate the difference. Uh, I first met Lawson Brigham, um, I think, at Woods Hole, which had been, what, 20 years ago? Yeah. He was there uh, 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 promoting his polar interests, but more uh, importantly, he was working on ocean policy issues. Um, I know a lot of people poo-poo the uh, interest in ocean policy because they think that uh, it's soft science. Well, it's not. Um, in fact, before anything can be done, 
in the, the real world, you better have uh, policymakers on your side willing to uh, support what you propose and to uh, uh, keep people from stealing your funds. There's more hands white, or reaching for money, uh, let's say in Washington, than there is money to fill them. So it's very competitive. And um, he's had a marvelous career uh, in the Coast Guard, uh, icebreaker uh, exposures before he became the commanding officer of uh, his icebreaker and made these wonderful expeditions. So I hope that uh, the honor tonight that he receives not only reflects uh, a couple of really outstanding voyages in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but also his uh, many years of, of uh, involvement with the polar uh, regions. And uh, as you heard earlier, he's uh, with the Arctic Commission. He lives in Alaska now. He's not an Alaskan, but that's where the action is, so he's up there. Um, and so he has uh, more or less put himself as a lifetime uh, polar advocate. And he's a doer as well as a dreamer. And you can't beat that combination. Uh, I'm proud to have known him for several years, and we've our paths have intersected uh, every now and then, and I get updated on what he did. Uh, he's done a very good book on um, Russian issues in the Arctic. It's a few years ago, this Soviet Union then. But uh, that involvement of a professional, of a sailor, uh, who uh, also understands the issues of this vast region, because the, uh, you, you know the United States is a polar country, uh, by virtue of Alaska, um, and that uh, over one million people live above the Arctic Circle. So there's resources, there are people, very complex issues. The, by comparison, the Antarctic is, is, is a rather simple place uh, when it comes to all of that because there are no permanent uh, well, land claims. There have been many claims made, but uh, they were never settled, and the Antarctic Treaty of 1961 uh, uh, had all of the nations, uh, even those who made claims to put that in abeyance. And it's worked very well. It has no parliament, no police force, no army, but many nations, uh, up to 50 nations, have cooperated in that area. So when you're bipolar, and I don't mean medically, <laughs> this, uh, uh, this is a wonderful place to work. I, I didn't get to those places until uh, after I had um, left my faculty position at University of Southern California uh, and uh, come up to Oregon. And so in 1994, I began going to the Arctic and the Antarctic. I'm not uh, any kind of expert. I know what's happening up there, but I'm not a scholar in those things. And, it, you know, I said earlier today that there are only um, three environments in the world where you say it's out of this world. You know, we've had, that's, uh, most of the time you're exaggerating. But uh, I would say that um, deep ocean exploration, where I've been involved, uh, space, you are literally out of the world, and finally, the polar regions. It, this means that uh, I can tell you where I've been and what I've done. I can even show you some of my pictures, but uh, nothing compares with being there and seeing what's happening. And, and everybody complains that their pictures don't do justice to the massive scope and... and um, uh, and activities in the polar regions, unless you're just sort of shooting a picture of one penguin or uh, one Native American up there. But if you're trying to get one of these large, you, know, you get, give people a feel of this, the grandeur and the scope of these polar regions, it's almost impossible. So those are the three places out of the world. Uh, and um, I, I think, I hope a lot of you or some of you will get a chance to go down there because now they have made uh, the polar regions very accessible for uh, adventure tourism. Uh, there are about 22 ships that go down during the Antarctic season, and I don't know how many are up in the Arctic, but quite a few. And you can go through the Northwest Passage or the Northeast Passage over the top of Russia. Uh, it's a little pricey, but uh, it's well worth it. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people in the expeditions I've been on, uh, and it, you won't find a sour face in the whole thing. Yes. It cost us a lot, and our son won't be able to go to college, but boy, was it great. So, <laughs> uh, so you can tell them, uh, you young folks here, 
go ahead and spend it for the Antarctic, but here's the deal. I go too. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm, I'm getting off the subject, I suppose. Um, I, I'm very pleased that Lawson is getting this honor because it's long overdue. Uh, it's, uh, it's a place sometimes we don't think very much about. It's very trendy now, isn't it? I mean, it's warming up, the ice is going away and all of that, but that's just in the last couple, three years. Scientists have seen these things for a long time, but uh, now ordinary citizens uh, in our country and other countries are beginning to realize this is the canary in the mine, that if the canary gets sick and dies, then uh, uh, those of us living on the rest of planet Earth are in for a very hard time. So that's why all the, the uh, uh, emphasis, and I'm sure Lawson uh, will uh, brief us on some of this. Anyway, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Captain Brigham Lawson, uh, United States Coast Guard retired, who will uh, speak to us about things polar. Captain. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, everyone. Is, this, is the mic on? Is the lap mic on? Is it now? Oh, very good. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I, I thank the uh, state of Delaware and the University of Delaware, of course, Provost Rich for uh, having us here tonight, and, of course, the American Geographical Society. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm honored, of course, to, to sign on behalf of... Uh, crew of the Polar Sea and the Coast Guard, and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak about the voyages for a few minutes. Big red ship of, of the United States Coast Guard, and of course for more than a century, America's polar ships have been operated by the Revenue Cutter Service 
and, uh, the, for and the forerunner of the Coast Guard, of course, at, at both ends of the world. The first ships around the great state of Alaska, the, the Corwin, the Bear, were revenue cutter service ships uh, enforcing the laws of the new territory of Alaska. And from the beginning of exploration of Antarctica, at least uh, from the 1940s, American uh, Coast Guard and Navy icebreakers sailed to Antarctica. In, in 1994, the Polar Sea, uh, one of uh, two of the largest icebreakers in the United States, and among the largest icebreakers in the world, uh, did have this unusual opportunity to sail to both ends of the world. Antarctica, great place. Composite satellite images on the left. You can see West Antarctica, the mountain range, the Trans-Antarctic Mountains across and to the right, the great plateau of East Antarctica. Great place, huge place, uh, a controller of the climate of Earth around the Southern Ocean and around the whole of the continent. Very cold place, much colder than the Arctic. Severe cold winds and cold weather uh, throughout the year. This area, the Ross Ice Shelf, the ice runs down the continent, down the plateau, around in the glaciers, and the glaciers ex exit. The glacial ice of thousands of years exits and falls into the ocean. This feature, one of the largest physical features on the planet, can be seen easily by satellite today. This is 400 nautical miles uh, face of the Ross Ice Shelf. 100 foot, roughly 100 foot above the sea level and 6 to 800 feet below. A mass of glacial ice rolling down the continent. We take these ships down to Antarctica to support the United States uh, National Science Foundation. Here's Polar Sea breaking a track in the ice, escorting a ship to supply the base, a large base, more than 1,000 people in summer at McMurdo Station. We're cutting a track in the ice to escort several large ships to this base, the largest base in Antarctica, run by the United States National Science Foundation, McMurdo Station. You might see this little island here. That's gravel on top of an ice island. That's about a 25 foot thick ice island where we pull and escort the ships around the turn here. There's one of, uh, there's a hut here, historic hut of the early explorers. We come around the turn and escort large ships, tankers, supply ships into the, into the base. Lots of ocean, but this ocean, much of it is covered with ice, and you seem a little lonely here, flying at about 2,000 feet above, looking down on the, the icebreaker, which is a large ship, 13,000 tons, 400 feet, but looks quite small when you're out here alone looking down. A long track, 40 nautical mile run. You can see part of the highway here, back and forth, cutting the ice, letting some of the wind push the ice out to clear a path so the larger ships, which are not icebreakers, can get to the base around the turn here and supply the particularly fuel for the next winter. We parked at the ship, and you can see the people out on the ice, the young crew members, men and women, about the ice to play football, not necessarily chase penguins, but uh, look at the penguins. Thick ice here, anywhere from four to six foot thick. You can see the ice is upturned along the side of the ship, and it's, it's fairly thick this day in uh, January 1994. When we cut a track, usually many of the marine mammals follow into the track. And during this day, I think it was the 9th of January, 1994, I happened to see a stern of the ship and grabbed my camera, several of my crew members uh, communicating with this marine mammal, minke whale. And if that's not communication, I don't know what is. What a great adventure for all of us. This minky whale, you can see the eye looking at the, the crew members here, not more than two feet away, nosing up through the ice that was cut by the icebreaker 
and, and communicating with the men and women of the crew of Polar Sea. Great adventure, not only for science, but certainly in this case for adventure. The sounds and the smells and the scents of the ship attract these great birds, the emperor penguins of Antarctica. And again, you can communicate with them. Most of the crew, you drop to your knees and you can see eye to eye with the, these great birds, which are three to four foot tall. And you're looking straight at their eyes and they are chattering and making a noise. Again, the local population and man, the birds have not seen man before, most of the birds, of course. And we're communicating a part of the great adventure of sailing aboard a great ship. When I uh, have the opportunity to present, uh, make presentations to small, to schools around the country, we always have a drill of counting the number of penguins <laughs> here. Uh, the other, I go back here, uh, 11,000 roughly in one spot uh, near the Ross Ice Shelf in, in scientific surveys of the number of, of penguins around the continent. The Ross Ice Shelf, I said, was 400 nautical miles across the face. And this is what it looks like in a clear and no wind this day, stretching extraordinary length, 400 nautical miles down from uh, east to west. You can see the strata in one of the bergs that has calved off the thousands of years of the snow cover, the annual snow cover, several millimeters a year, rising up and creating, of course, the, the glacial landmass on top of Antarctica. Sometimes a little tricky to navigate. All of these icebergs are grounded on the seabed. Seabed here is about 500 foot depth, and it's a challenge and entertaining to sail amongst these great bergs, all that have come off and calved off the Ross Ice Shelf out into the open ocean. On, on this special voyage in January and February of 1994, we sailed along the face of the Ross Ice Shelf with a team from the British Antarctic Survey and Lamont uh, Earth Observatory, named today, from Columbia University, scientists funded by the National Science Foundation to take a very detailed survey, not only of the glacier, but of the seawater down to depth and a very detailed survey along the 400 nautical miles length of the Ross Ice Shelf. Endless clear days, cold temperatures, usually some wind off the continent to the ocean, and we had uh, one, one day we had a temperature that was minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the one day in all of these voyages that I could feel the cold in the ship. Ship is air conditioned, usually warm, climate controlled, but the minus 62 degrees outside actually started to chill the great ship Polar Sea. A famous place, famous location, famous in, in many senses, is the Bay of Wales on the eastern edge of the Ross Ice Shelf. And in 1994, we reached this location, which is the closest location and has been for now more than a century and a half, the closest that you can take a ship closest to South Pole. South Pole is roughly 700 miles away from here, but anywhere, any point around the continent, this is the closest point. And we did sail there along this expedition. We, we knew we were close to it, so we decided to sail even closer. I don't know if you can see the red paint, <laughs> but we uh, drove the... Uh, bow of the ship, and then, of course, looked at the uh, GPS receiver to uh, annotate and, and, and record uh, how far south we were. 690 nautical miles from South Pole, the southernmost location on the planet that one can navigate a ship, surface or subsurface. There's no indication that it has been uh, and any submarines that close to the Bay of Wales has been a submarine down in Antarctica in the past, but not, not, not that close to the ice edge. 
1911, when Roland Amundsen was down and on the, aboard the great ship Fram, he sailed to the Bay of Wales because it's the closest point to the South Pole, and he took off and skied with the dogs and the ski team to the South Pole from the Bay of Wales. And in fact, he was closer with the Fram, was alongside the ice edge, and the Fram was about 12 nautical miles closer in 1911. This point, this closest point, southernmost point, of course, is dynamic and moving from year to year as the great glacier advances and retreats back and forth. So this is a changing position, which is quite extraordinary. Great place to operate ships and to visit Antarctica, great <laughs> vistas. And here we are, and there's Dr. Don Walsh's location, 37,000 feet below the ocean in 1960, 11,000 meters depth, Mariana Trench with Jacques Picard and the Bathyscaphe Trieste. And our voyage from Seattle down to Hawaii and Australia to the ice for three and a half months of scientific operations and ice breaking to the southernmost location on the planet here, a navigable by ship, and then, of course, back up to a shipyard and back to Seattle. During this voyage, I was getting hundreds of messages and participating in the planning of another voyage that would take uh, two ships, hopefully, across the, the top of the world. The Arctic Ocean section was designed by a group of 70 scientists from five countries, but principally from the United States and Canada, to take uh, two ships, the Louis St. Laurent, Canada's largest icebreaker, and Polar Sea, and enter the, from the Pacific side and take a track, hopefully, that would take us to the North Pole and out into the Atlantic. And this Arctic Ocean section was, in fact, to take a vertical section of data from the atmosphere, take information on the sea ice, through the ocean to the seabed, take a vertical section of data and carry that across the top of the world, if possible. You can see that the ship is kind of a half of a football when you cut it off. And that has, uh, it gives it remarkable qualities out in the open ocean, rolling about. You can see the round hull of the ship, the, the contoured bow, the large propeller blades, the large rudder. Huge ship, but whale-shaped. So when you're out in the open ocean, it's a slow roll all the way across the Pacific for 40 days down to Antarctica. <laughs> I, I, I experienced it only too well over many voyages to Antarctica on these types of ships. But we sailed in July of 1994, left Seattle, went up through uh, the Aleutian chain and up through Bering Strait, the two ships together, carrying 70 scientists into the ice to carry a full range of integrated Arctic research from atmospheric research, physical oceanography, marine geology, and a whole host of biological studies on board. We had on board a satellite receiver and the Polar Sea and the Polar Star sister ship were the first polar ships in history to have real-time satellite imagery come down to the ship uh, in the mid-1980s. So by 1994, we had an advanced system. This is a visible image of Bering Strait. We sail north through the islands here, up to the ice edge, and we're located somewhere here in the 26th of July. This is uh, Wrangell Island, coast of Siberia, across the coast of Alaska. Uh, Barrow is up here, and Bering Strait here. This is what it looks like in a passive microwave image, where we're looking at the difference between the water and the return of the signal that comes back, the difference between water and the ice cover. These false colors give some idea of the concentration, the coverage of ice. So we use these to hopefully navigate through the ice strategically several days in advance. The satellite would pass over. You can see the band. And there were eight satellite passes every day that would give us this, this color-coded picture of the sea ice to help us navigate through the ice. You can see the yellow track there. And I wanted to show you what this point 
look like from the bridge of the ship. Completely ice covered, melt ponds in the summer as the surface melt is occurring on the ice. The ice here is about four foot thick as we're sailing north of the coast of Alaska. Lots of interesting observations. This is sediment and sand embedded in the sea ice and carried hundreds if not thousands of nautical miles across. The depth here is about a mile deep. So this sand and mud has not come from the benthic environment. It's carried from the great rivers of Russia out into the central part of the Arctic Ocean. Gives us this commentary on how things can be transported from the land into the ocean. So we saw this dirty ice all the way across in, in different patches the Arctic Ocean. 500 nautical miles from land, a tree, a log, embedded in the sea ice. Again, no doubt this log came from Siberia, from one of the great rivers, the Lena River perhaps, hard to tell, but fascinating to see in the middle of nowhere in the ice this uh, remnants of a tree and a log. One of the pilots is using an advanced instrument to cut this, uh, take a sample here, because <laughs> we couldn't dig the log out of the ice. It, it seemed to be about, about 50 foot long into the ice, so it was hard to dig out. Half the time on the left there, the polar sea was in the lead. Then we would leapfrog, and half the time on the right, you can see we were following astern of the Louis Saint Laurent. Sometimes the Louis Saint Laurent was quite close astern. This is about uh, 75 foot astern. You can see how, how the atmosphere in the summertime is great fog. That's what it looks like from a satellite picture, a visible image. 8th of August. That's what it looks like in another advanced sensor, the passive microwave. You can see our track up to the north. Here it is, the 9th of August. We're crossing an area of very difficult ice. These concentrations here are nearly 100% cover. No free water, no open water as we go north towards the North Pole. Divers were sent down at 40 locations to sample the phytoplankton. And, and, and the zooplankton in, in the seawater. We parked the ship where we could in openings and, and leads in the ice. We would drop probes at 4,000 meters, two miles down to the seabed and, and sit at these locations for about 27 hours as we sampled the whole range of, of information. 85 north uh, is, is, is very far north in, in the northern uh, latitudes. And it's unlikely that you would see these folks, or at least the scientists told us, the polar bear scientists said that we would not see in the central Arctic Ocean our friends, the polar bears. Well, here's a 300-pound, two, three-year-old, roughly three-year-old male. And, of course, his fate was to at least be tranquilized for a few hours and tagged and sampled. The, uh, the veterinarians and the scientists were looking for PCBs, took blood samples, a tooth from the, from the uh, polar bear, this antiseptic here. Uh, but one of the tricks and one of the challenges is to weigh the bear. So we rolled the bear. I say we, this is one of the opportunities I had a chance to go out to the ice and, and see how careful and how, uh, how careful the scientists were with the bear. We weighed the bear, and then, of course, I put my hand on the bear's head because the, the, the scientist said that he was immobilized and he moved his head. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I still have my hand, as you can see. But what it, for me, of course, extraordinary experience to be up close and so personal with the, with the polar bear, virtually in the middle, in the most isolated part of the Arctic Ocean. The realm of the polar bear, we, we tagged, the scientist tagged, polar bears and saw cubs and mother polar bears all the way across the top of the world. So the realm of the polar bear is, in fact, the entire circumpolar basin. I have to show this slide because after an hour or so of watching, he gets up and away he goes. Probably has a sore tooth, but uh, nonetheless, no worse for wear. And he's on to his hunting. Now on to the North Pole at 85 North, on the way up to 90. 
fairly challenging ice conditions. The ice here in these pictures, about five foot thick. Freezing up in August, early freeze. I had a couple of our divers sit in one of these melt ponds just to take a picture of what it, would look, what it was looking like as we headed north. Uh, the the uh, International Airport near the North Pole and our polar bear watch here because now we know there are polar bears all the way across so we had to have our polar bear uh, watch uh, on board ready to go. I don't know if you can read that, 8958.746, if you believe in the numbers, close to the North Pole. But what we did was send Coast Guard helicopter out to what we thought was the exact location by GPS, the North Pole. We put a transponder here on the ice so that the two ships' radars could communicate with the transponder and ease in and get as close to the North Pole as we thought was, was possible. And we did that on the 22nd of August, 1994. We arrived at the North Pole to take a 48-hour station and sample from the atmosphere again all the way to the seabed, two nautical miles, well, two, 10, uh, let's see, let me think now, 4,000 meters, two miles down to the seabed. Our expedition leader, you can't read it, I guess, physical oceanographer Knut Agard, a distinguished scientist, one of the leading Arctic oceanographers in the world, was our expedition leader throughout this voyage. He's standing under the, the uh, barber pole there at the, at the North Pole. Interesting structures people put on the ice. This one uh, was a, an address pole, uh, everyone's address. So all the, the uh, nearly 200 people we had on both ships had their address pointing in some direction to where your home port was in your hometown. Ship's company at the North Pole. Ob obligatory baseball game that you've probably seen from the nuclear submariners who play baseball at the North Pole when they surface. Canada and the United States, and we had Russian team also, which I'll mention in a minute. Russian helicopter in the top came overhead. This is a Russian-made uh, Russian helicopter a German-made Canadian helicopter, and a French-made American helicopter. So it's an international collection of helicopters at the North Pole. Nine nautical miles away was this great ship, the Russian nuclear icebreaker Yamal, and the captains in nuclear-powered twin nuclear reactors. And Don Waltz has sailed a number of times on these great ships with tourists to the North Pole. And in fact, Don, I think you've sailed on Yamal. The, the ship had a group of children aboard. It was the 1994, it was the year of the family, and the Russians had a group of children, an international group of children aboard to take them to the North Pole. This Jaws is the chief mate's smile. <laughs> uh, if you know anything about ships, the number two, or the number one, I guess, uh, besides the captain, is supposed to carry out all the duties, and the captain walks around with a cup of coffee and is a very pleasant person, communicator, and, and the number one does all the uh, cracking of the whip on everyone. So that's the chief mate's smile. I wondered if I had put that on the polar sea, what I would have been consigned, I think, to some desk job somewhere. Three ships at the North Pole, or near the North Pole, nine, miles, nine nautical miles away. You can see the, our flag, flag of Mermant Shipping, Merchant Marine uh, Merchant uh, Company and the Louis Saint Laurent and Polar Sea. The three captains, myself to the right as American military officer, uh, Captain Grandy to the left, and we, we, were, we came aboard the Russian ship, we were about ready to have a toast, and the captain of the Russian ship, Andrei Shmirnov, introduces himself. So we're about to have a glass of vodka, and he introduces himself as Andrei Shmirnov <laughs> at the North Pole. Three captains from the largest Arctic countries, Canada, the United States, and, and Russia. When we came up astern of the great ship Yamal, the captain radioed and said, please don't get too close to upset our swimming pool. And sure enough, this is the chief engineer of the Yamal swim, swimming across this open water area. We had an artist and a medical doctor aboard, a retired medical surgeon, 
and uh, Dr. Drebart was painting and commiserating with the chief engineer who had just swum, swam across this open area. Of course, we're all at the North Pole with all of this. 550 people at the North Pole eating muskox, having a little vodka, uh, taking science, uh, 24 hours a day doing science, uh, all at the North Pole. The three ships. And now, a couple of images on the way out. Here's Greenland, Svalbard. So we're coming into the Atlantic, almost to the ice edge. All of the yellows and reds are low concentration of sea ice, the ice edge, and of course the open water here. Number of sites, mother and cub, almost identical in size, and two ships at the end of the voyage near the ice edge. We had crossed the Arctic Ocean. It's the first surface ship cr uh, crossing of the Arctic Ocean, done for science, done for exploration, and, and uh, it took about 40 days to go across the top of the world. We sailed, the two ships sailed, independently, at least for this portion. We sailed from Seattle all the way around Greenland and then back through the Panama Canal and, and, and arrived back in Seattle, only to go to Antarctica again. But nonetheless, this is the first uh, full transit of any surface ships of the entire North American continent, including Greenland. So another quirk and uh, geographical accomplishment of these uh, voyages. The other voyage uh, down south uh, at the southernmost extremity and the two points on the globe. The, the extraordinary thing is that uh, at the end of, it took to the end of the 20th century for a single ship to reach these limits of the global ocean and, and that ship is the Polar Sea. It's remarkable that the name Polar Sea connotes uh, the Polar Seas, reaching the limits of the polar oceans of the Polar Seas in Antarctica and up at the top of the world. Extraordinary achievement uh, in an extraordinary crew and, and ship. I thank uh, American Geographical Society for this great honor. I sign on behalf of the crew of Polar Sea, where, wherever they are today, and the scientific parties that were aboard on both trips. It was a great and challenging uh, set of expeditions. I think it's uh, tremendous that it's, a, uh, it's the United States who who uh, conducted these voyages, dreamed these voyages, funded these voyages by the National Science Foundation, and, and conducted them on a Coast Guard cutter with scientists from a number of nations, but principally Canada and the United States, to sail to both ends of the world. Quite, quite extraordinary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely extraordinary. Just a, a couple things before we leave. It's, well, before we avail ourselves of the goodies that are out in the reception area, uh, both of the liquid, solid, and uh, intellectual kind. Dr. Uh, Dr. Brigham will be giving two further talks on the University of Delaware campus. One is at 1.30 tomorrow. It's uh, a talk that is sponsored jointly by the College of Marine and Earth Studies and the Learner School, or Learner College of Business and Economics. It's at 1.30 in Robinson Hall. And at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, February 14th, two, two evenings from now, in this building, he will be giving the inaugural Carlson Public Lecture. So I certainly hope that all of you can, uh, can make it to that. There, uh, please, as I say, stay for the reception. Talk with Dr. Uh, Dr. Brigham, Dr. Walsh, Mr. Wilford, Director Byrd, and President Dobson. The globe will still be up here for a limited time, amount of time. You can come up and look at it. Please don't touch. And uh, 
It will be going down in about 25 minutes. It'll be, be put in its case. As you can imagine, it's a very view, uh, valuable thing, and it needs to be treated with extreme care. Now, another thing that I haven't mentioned up until this point is that Dr. Brigham has been extraordinarily generous in loaning the University of Delaware, not just for tonight, but for the next month, and, and absolutely, I keep using this word, extraordinary collection, his personal collection of antique polar maps, many of which go back into the 18th century. They are on display out in the reception area. Again, look to your heart's content, but please don't touch them. We're also very privileged to have Ms. Julia Dooley, who is a elementary school teacher in the Christina School District, who just spent, she was one of five teachers who was selected nationwide to participate in the U.S. National Science Foundation drilling project in Antarctica. She just came back in December from two months in Antarctica. We have a fine collection of her photography from Antarctica, but since she come, came back, she's been an absolute dynamo on behalf of polar research by the younger members of the state of Delaware, elementary school kids, and we have their projects. We also have uh, some pictures of them. There is a continuous looping PowerPoint presentation that talks about the history of William Samuel Carlson in far more detail than I did or than Dan Rich, Dan Rich did tonight. It has the history of the American Geographic so Geographical Society, Flyers and Explorers Globe uh, details about the accomplishments of about 10 of the polar, si uh, the polar signers. We also have some material on uh, Ms. Dooley's students. And there's also, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we've just had a study abroad trip back from Antarctica. And there is also a fine display of their photography on the north end of the building. So please. Uh, avail yourselves. There's wine and soft drinks. We have some very nice catered uh, food out here. And um, we'll be here for the next at least 45 minutes. And uh, take a look at all these things and enjoy. Thank you very much for coming, especially under these adverse circumstances.